Welcome to Shore Perspectives, a community feature of WESR Radio, highlighting the spirit of the shore from those who call it home. I'm Gerald Boyd, and I live in Eastville, Virginia, on the Oak Grove Plantation. Uh, we came here uh, in 1953 as migrant workers from Mobile, Alabama, and uh, we, it became home for us. We returned in 2014 um, after having lived and worked for several years in Atlanta um, and coming here to uh, back home um, there's the opportunity to work in several ways. As you may know Polly and I founded uh, Peace Work Center for Well-Being and we concern ourselves with brain health uh, in a variety of ways, offering a variety of, uh, of programs. Um, we work in the areas of anger management, uh, domestic violence, uh, perpetrator counseling, um, and counseling uh, in terms of addictions, um, substance abuse addiction, uh, and many other areas. In addition, um, We've co-founded Eastern Shore Training and Consulting, Inc., uh, which has this focus on the reducing the impact of poverty on the lives of people here on the shore. Um, to that end, uh, we offer two $2,500 scholarships to graduating seniors in both counties. Um, I serve uh, with the NAACP, uh, serve on the Board of Directors of the Chamber of Commerce, um, and I'm um, restoring the Samuel D. Outlaw blacksmith shop in Onancop. So there are a variety of ways in which we uh, serve, in which I serve, so that uh, my work um, goes directly at those institutions and systems which, uh, which knowingly or not produce uh, barriers for the less fortunate to overcome. I was raised in abject poverty here on the Eastern Shore and uh, on my return to Mobile in 1962 after graduating from high school here I got involved with the NACP which had been enjoined by then Governor Patterson of Alabama from participating uh, from operating uh, in, in the state of Alabama. I joined with um, men who were, of course, older than I. Um, uh, John LaFleur, uh, Freeman Pollard, uh, Henry C. Williams. These men were, were effective civil rights leaders in Mobile at that time, and I joined with them and became the um, leader of the college and high school students whose mission it was to desegregate the public facilities in Mobile at that time and this was in early the early 60s and so we were relatively successful at getting that done. Uh, since that time uh, I have had a great deal of uh, uh, passion and experience around taking a look at reducing uh, the impacts of poverty, of, uh, of being uh, involved in anti-racist racism movements, uh, involved in desegregation of public schools in, in California, and in, uh, that is, the Bay Area, and in Monterey, and in other arenas. So yeah, I, I remain quite passionate about the, uh, the notion of equity, uh, inclusion, and justice here in this country. This country, after all, is mine uh, as much as anyone else's. And it is my uh, intent to make it the best country on the planet. And we can do that by paying attention to us first as human beings. Then we can pay attention to us. Uh, or what follows naturally, therefore, is the paying attention to us as women and as men, as uh, African Americans and as European Americans and Asian Americans and LGBTQ people. So any of us human beings 
showing up in all of our uh, diverse uh, differences uh, should and ought to be completely and absolutely respected and absolutely and completely included in all decisions uh, affecting our lives and the lives of those who uh, look like us, and that is to say all human beings. The benefit of many of the privileges of those who are, may be in the category of haves. Um, I was a have-not. And um, it is not a wonderful position to be in. It has impacts on the uh, thinking and feeling, on the very being of a human being, to be denied uh, basic human and civil rights. Understand that I was born in 1943, and so in my early life was in segregated Mobile, Alabama, and I can remember well uh, not being able to play with white kids, not being able to look a white person in the eye, not being able to speak to them, shake their hands, or even share the same sidewalk with them. And so early on, I got a, 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 a deep dip into uh, racism and its effects. Uh, it takes a lifetime to... to um, get rid of these impacts. And, uh, and so what I want most is to help create a society in which children, all children, can grow up free of these unnecessary shackles so that the full potential of the human spirit may be made visible, uh, even more visible, through um, our, our creativity, uh, through the inventions we may come up with, through the books we may write, through the paintings we paint, and through indeed all of the human expression. Um, so I most want to see human beings freed from any impediments to, um, to spirit. You have a specific program for men and young boys. Tell right, me, right. Tell me right. a little bit about that. So it's, it's evolving, uh, uh, and we currently name it um, the Fathering Program, or Fathering Circle, Circle. And we basically focused on non-custodial fathers. Um, that seems to be quite a population of uh, young children and boys who live in households headed by uh, single parents. And so studies show that children who are involved with their fathers improve their lives. Their grades improve at school uh, and they improve in terms of behavior in the, in the community. Um, and none of us know a whole lot about parenting. Uh, and so it seems kind of natural to invite men to come together and, and just talk about their experience of being involved with their children. Um, to share their, in the, in the term words of uh, uh, the 12 step program, to share their experience, strength and hope around uh, raising their children and uh, aid and assist each other. The impact of poverty is most seen when we think about the trauma that it imprints on the human body and we carry trauma in our bodies and in our hearts and these traumas can be thought of uh, in terms like a physical injury, which may leave scar tissue. Well, that's the emotional scarring, uh, or scar tissue that is left on the human being. And so I, I really want to uh, continue to work with human beings around how do we, um, how do we approach 
uh, healing from generational trauma, that is, the traumas being passed down generation after generation stemming from having been an enslaved people, uh, how do we heal the, the, the other uh, or, or residual uh, uh, traumas that our parents and, 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 and so on who may be impacted in a way that, uh, that we, we don't have correct diets or we don't take care of our, our bodies in the way that we need to or there's alcohol or drugs in the family or other forms uh, such as anxiety, depression, all of these can impact a child and of course can be passed down to them and they start the living out of that scar tissue, out of that woundedness. Somebody has to reach out to the person and make, create an atmosphere in which it is okay for them to decide, I'm going to go for help, something is not well with me. We can appreciate the clean pain of healing from the bruises we sustained, or we can wait and allow the dirty pain to force us deeper into the woundedness until we have no other choice but to seek help or be forced to seek the help. I would simply say remember your goodness and live out of that goodness. Gerald Boyd, co-founder of PeaceWorks and Estesi, invites anyone to stop by their office at 3100 Main Street, Exmoor, call 757-656-3460, or visit their website, peaceworkscenter.com. For WESR and Shore Perspectives, I'm Kelly Gaskell.